Good morning, everybody. Uh, we've got a, uh, a fairly tight schedule today, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we, have a, we have a lot of people talking, a lot of information to disseminate. Um, I'll, uh, I hope, uh, I hope the, uh, the slides and the slide presentations are, are easily digestible, and, uh, and you're going to get a lot out of them. Um, I first wanted to uh, just introduce uh, the person that's going to come up and, and talk first. She's our, uh, the FAST new scientific uh, officer, chief scientific officer, Allison Barrent. Um, she's a DVM. She got her degree from Cornell. Um, she now works in a large animal hospital in New York City. She's the director of interventional endoscopy. Uh, and for the last 10 years, she's been doing a lot of research, clinical research, in novel therapeutics and uh, novel medical devices in uh, animal population. Um, she's incredibly knowledgeable about all things Angelman. She uh, really kind of leads and directs the, uh, the fire team and the fire initiative. Uh, and we're, we're really lucky to have her as the chief scientific officer here at FAST. So uh, everybody, please help me welcome Allison Brett. Can you hear me okay? I'm gonna move this out of the way here. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Weber, for that. That was ni very nice and unnecessary. Um, I first wanna just, uh, I'll introduce everybody, but I want to just announce that if you need to use the Wi-Fi, um, the password is FAST2016, um, so everyone knows that, as well as if you wouldn't mind everyone turning off your cell phones, at least put it on vibrate or silent, um, so that it's not disturbing to other people around you with various pings of text messages, but we know everyone needs to stay in the loop with people at home. Um, so just keep it on silent if possible. Um, and also we're gonna try to save questions to the end so that we can let all the speakers, they have a short period of time to get through a lot of information, um, but we're gonna have plenty of time for questions after each lecture. Um, and certainly at the break, you're, feel free to come up and talk to everybody individually. Um, so uh, we're really excited about today. Uh, today is really going to be filled with a lot of information. So I hope everybody really gets their, their um, ears out there and, and starts listening. What we're going to start with is our FAST FIRE team. FIRE means the FAST Integrative Environment Research. Um, FAST Integrative Research Environment. And what this group is, is it's a consortium. And it's a really novel approach to um, scientists working together from various universities in order to create the most expedited science and research. And we're really lucky that we have the leaders actually in the world in Angelman syndrome working with and um, for our children. So th this is amazing. This is something FAST started about four years ago and you will see over the course of the day how far they've come and what amazing work they've done. So you guys should really be so proud of the scientists that are working for you and your children every single day. Um, the first talk is going to be, we're going to really have the, the morning be about kind of the basics of science because a lot of people in the room I think are first time comers too fast to the, to the summit and a lot of new parents are in the room and I know certainly when I got diagnosed um, with my daughter having Angelman syndrome two years ago, it was something that was completely new to me. What is this genetic disaster? And I didn't really understand what this all meant. And I'm a medical professional, so I have a lot of scientific background, and it was, it was difficult for me to understand, so I can only imagine how difficult it is for people that have no scientific knowledge. So I think what we're trying to do today is really break it down to the basics of science so that you guys can understand why is this important for me and my child? What does this translate to? It's really easy to talk about all these large words and feel really smart when you say them, but it means nothing if you don't understand what they mean. So what we're really trying to do today is break it down to the nitty gritty of what this means for you and your child and, or, or your loved ones. Um, and we want you to ask questions so that you can really feel that you walk away from this with a really good understanding because the future is right in front of us. We are seriously talking about clinical trials in the next 24 months, some starting in the next month. So, you know, in the next 24 months, it's going to be huge for you guys to be making decisions for your children, um, really understanding what you're getting yourselves into and how this can be groundbreaking for all of us. So really listen, pay attention, and feel free to please ask questions. Um, so we can start with the first lecture. Great. So we're just going to initially start with basic therapeutics 101. Wrong mic? Oh, wrong remote. This is the remote here. Oh, OK. Yeah. Oh. 
Oh, we're gonna work it from here? Oh, okay, that's fine. So this is forward back, which one's forward and which one's back? Okay, got it. Okay, that works. Okay, um, so, so first we're just gonna, um, the first lecture is gonna be a quick lecture on um, what, what does ther therapeutics mean for our children and does any of this make sense? And I think the basic science of this is, needs to be understood before you can really have a good grasp of what can this do for my child. So what we know about Angelman syndrome is that it's caused by a significant reduction in the expression of one specific gene. And that gene is called UBE3A. Um, so when we talk about UBE3A, this is the gene that is located on one of our 46 chromosomes. And that one chromosome is cr of chromosome 15. Chromosome 15, you can see here that we have 46 chromosomes in our body. So this is a karyotype of a, of a female person. We have 46 chromosomes, and there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. We get one of those pairs from our mother and one from our father. So we have 23 chromosomes, one from mom, one from dad, making up 46 total chromosomes in our genome. And each chromosome is made up of thousands and thousands of genes. And they each code to produce something like a protein. And those proteins are really important for all of the functions of our body that we do every single day. Abnormalities in any gene, and we have about 26,000 genes in our genome, an abnormality in just one single gene, like UBE3A, can result in some type of disease or syndrome. And that is when that is a deficiency in UBE3A, for various reasons, that is Angelman syndrome. And that's what we're all facing every day. Okay, chromosome 15 sits right here. We have a maternal and a paternal copy, and this is the chromosome that has an abnormality in one of its genes. So let's just make that a little bit bigger here. So what we can see is that we have the paternal or the father's copy, the maternal and the mother's copy of that gene, of, of that chromosome. And on that chromosome, I'm, I'm gonna make this a little bit of a schematic just to make this seem a little bit more simple. But what you can see is one little area on this chromosome is this gene. These are all different genes here. And one of them is called UBE3A. And we have the father's copy and we have the mother's copy. And what's very interesting about this specific gene is that on the father's copy, there has been a stop placed on it. So it is never read in you, in me, and in all of our children, this gene is not read on the father's copy in the brain. And that is very, very unique to this type of gene, which is why it is called an imprinted gene. So if you don't have this being read, what happens is that you are relying on only the mother's copy being read. And when that is the case, that UBE3A, if it is read appropriately, you have a neurotypical or non-Angelman human. Now, if it is abnormal, and there's anything that's wrong with that gene, because it is not read on the father's copy, the father's side is read and that part is skipped and then the, gene can, the chromosome continues to be read. So you have nothing happening in the area of UB3A on the father's copy and you have it read on the mother's copy. So if we take that and, as a normal human and we, something happens to the mother's copy of that gene on chromosome 15, so this is normal, but let's just say it's missing or it's deleted. Let's say that you have two father's copies or UPD, uniparental disomy. So you have UPD here. So both are not read because they're the father's copy. So you have two stops. What if you have a mutation? So if you're mutated, what happens is that the, the gene is present, but there's something wrong with it in terms of its sequence so that the body is not reading it properly. So you don't have a functional gene. And you can even have an imprinting center defect, in which case you have a, the gene is present, but for the body to know to turn it on and read it, that area is not normal. So it is not actually read even though it's present. So regardless of the, the, what we call the genotype, meaning the type of genetic abnormality that you have, you result in a very similar phenotype, which means the symptoms that you distribute or that you exhibit because of this missing functional gene. Does that make sense? So this ultimately means no matter what the situation, you have Angelman syndrome.
So let's talk about why that matters. Of 26,000 or more genes in our genome, how come this one single gene seems to be so important? What is it about that gene that's so important? So what we know about this gene is that it's vital in how the brain controls functions of the body. That includes things like speech, movement, learning, memory. All of those things are very much affected by the function of the proteins made by this gene. Remember I said that genes make proteins. Um, so proteins provide the instruct, the gene provides the instructions in order to make the proteins and our body works off of various types of proteins. The protein actually it, that it makes is an enzyme. And I'm getting a little scientific, but I want you to just follow me here. This enzyme is very important. And the reason it's important is that that enzyme will tag various other proteins that are made from other genes in the brain to say we want more of you or we want less of you. And it's a very, very fine-tuned system on how the brain works and how all of these proteins need to work together in order to have appropriate function. So if you don't have the appropriate tagging mechanism by these proteins, then what's going to happen is that some other proteins might not be degraded or broken down like they should. Some other proteins might not be made like they should. So we could have some deficiencies in areas and some excess in areas. And that's part of the, how important UBE3A is as a protein. What we know is that because this protein is very important in removal in order to make cells work appropriately, if we lose that ability, then we're going to have a buildup of proteins, OK? And this is just one really simple example. And you know, this, this picture is um, courtesy of Ovid Therapeutics. And, and I, I love this picture because it really made a lot of sense to me when I was trying to understand Angelman syndrome. So I hope it does to you as well. So this is a really important example. So this is a, neur a neuron, the bottom of a neuron at the synapse, which is basically the junction of one neuron and another neuron in the brain. And this area, the space between the two, is how, how nerves communicate. And nerve communication is incredibly important. And the reason for that is our, our neurons in our brain, the brain cells, have to tell the other brain cells and, other, and muscles and various different you know, areas of the body what to do. And that communication happens through things like proteins or chemicals, what we call neurotransmitters. So this area is very important in this communication. And what, when we don't have enough UBE3A, what happens is that we have the buildup of certain proteins, like I said, because we're not breaking them down. And one of those proteins that might build up here is a channel in the, in the neuron. And this channel is responsible for eating up certain types of chemicals in this space. And one of the chemicals that's incredibly important is a chemical called GABA. And most of you have probably heard of GABA. And we talk a lot about GABA in our community, that our kids are GABA deficient. GABA, just so you have to understand what does GABA do, GABA is responsible for keeping our brain calm. That's the easiest way to think about it. GABA is kind of like Valium. It keeps your brain calm. It keeps you in check. It allows you to think about things like, I'm going to take a step. And if I step with my left foot, I have to relax my right foot. And if I'm going to do that, something has to be excited, like my left foot, while my right foot is inhibited so that it can stop walking. So we have to think about this excitation and inhibition as a balance all at the same time. And if we don't have that, and we only have excitation because GABA is not present to give us that inhibition, what that ultimately means is that we lose something called tonic inhibition. Loss of tonic inhibition is what you're going to hear a lot about over the course of the next couple of months. And when we lose tonic inhibition, that means that we don't have the ability to calm down. We don't have the ability to easily stop all of the noise that's happening in our brain. And when we don't have the ability to stop that, we have poor balance because we can't rest and think about staying still. We have poor muscle coordination, lack of speech. We need to use hundreds of muscles in our tongue, our face, our lips, our head in order to speak. And if we can't coordinate that with excitation and a proper inhibition, we can't speak. But that doesn't mean that our brain doesn't want to say a whole heck of a lot. It just means that we can't get it out through speech. And that's what's happening here. We could have seizures because we have too much excitation. We can have poor sleep because we can't calm and relax in order to go to sleep or stay asleep. We have anxiety because we feel all of this excitation all the time. 
and that's very scary. Dyspraxia or apraxia, we want to do something, and the more we want to do it, the more we're firing with excitation. But if we don't have the inhibition, we can't actually do what we want to do because the noise gets louder and louder in our brain. Poor attention spans. Now, I don't know about you guys, but this, this describes my daughter. So I suspect that this describes most of my children as well, in that they don't have enough tonic inhibition, but they have way too much excitation. And this is what we're dealing with with Angelman syndrome. So I know you all just want to know, thank you for that, how do we fix it? Get to the bottom line. What are we going to do here? Why are we here? Why are we out raising money every single day to fix this? How do we accomplish that? So this is what you want to think about when we think about therapeutics and the different options that are becoming available to our children, if not already available. So this is a neuron, which is a cell in the, in the brain. The, the cells of the brain are called neurons. Um, and they can communicate one neuron to another neuron. And they communicate through these long, long um, tr transporters here. So basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take a signal, and it's going to come down, and it's going to activate another nerve, or it's going to activate a muscle. And this communication is where it's very, very important. But what we know about the neuron is in our children, we are missing this gene, UBE3A, right? So this is in the neuron. The father's side is silenced. The mother's side is not working properly because we are missing that gene. So what can we do in order to give them their function back? How do we give them back this tonic inhibition that they're missing? OK, so one option is that we replace the gene. Doesn't that seem pretty simple? They're missing a gene. You give it back. Why is this taking so long? You know, this is a good question. We replace the, pro OK, so you don't want to replace the gene. Maybe we replace the protein, the UV3 protein that the gene makes. But how do we do that? Well, that, that's pretty complicated, actually. Um, you know, to, to the lay people, that seems like, what are you guys waiting for? But that, that's pretty complicated. But it doesn't mean it's impossible. It's actually very, very possible. So what we want to do is we want to take this gene or this protein, and we want to deliver it into the brain, into every one of our neurons if we can, in order for these neurons to have the proper amount, or at least some, of UBE3 that they're missing. So how is that accomplished? So you take this virus. This, it's called viral vectors, which is basically a car, a transporter. It is taking the gene in the car, it's driving it into the brain and driving it into the cells so that this gene can be produced, and then we just replace what's missing. And then we get to the, the, the bottom of the, the nook of the problem and we replace it. So we can do that by inserting a good copy of the UBE3A gene or protein. And that is through a virus vector. And when we talk about viral vectors, you're going to hear words like AAV, adenovirus-associated vector. So that one of the viruses you can use is adenovirus. They take this virus, they genetically modify it to remove all of the bad parts, and all it is left with is a shell, an envelope, that actually can move very beautifully into cells of the body, one of which would be the, the central nervous system or the brain and spinal cord. So if we can take that adenovirus, get rid of the bad part so it doesn't cause any disease, but it can bring with it whatever is packaged inside, that would be our gene, UBE3A. Deliver that into the neuron, and then go ahead and have yourself a party and read your UBE3A, and let's get back to business. So that makes a lot of sense. So that's one approach. What, what about the fact that we have a working copy of this gene on the father's side and it's just silenced? What if we give them back their father's copy by just turning it on? And we, you may hear the term, turn on the paternal allele. Okay? What that means is we just turn it on. Forget the stop. Let's turn it on. Okay? Other people might say, stop the stop. Okay? That makes sense. We're going to stop the stop. Or you may hear, activate the paternal. That's what this means. We're going to activate the father's copy of the gene. We're going to leave the mother's copy where she has no UB3A. We're going to activate the father's copy so that the whole gene is read and that the UB3 gene can be read. Well, that seems like science fiction. Can we do that? How do you modify the gene? This is something called epigenetics. Again, another word you're going to hear a lot about in the future, not only today, but in the lives of your children. And when we talk about doing that and, and editing the gene, what we're going to do is we're going to be talking about something called ATFs, or artificial transcription factors. And that's what Dr. Siegel, Dr. David Siegel, is going to be talking a lot about today. Okay? Or 
ASOs. You probably heard a lot about ASOs, which is antisense oligonucleotides. So Dr. Art Baudet is going to be here today. He's going to talk a lot about that. Dr. Siegel is going to talk a lot about that. So this is something that you've probably been hearing about um, in the, over the past year or so. Um, so ATFs, also known as zinc fingers, or ASOs. Okay, And that's how we turn on the paternal allele. And then finally, what about downstream therapeutics? So we want to think about this in three ways. We have upstream, give the gene back. Upstream, turn on the father's copy. Or downstream, forget the gene. Why don't we just give them back tonic inhibition at the, at the receptor level, at the junction of the nerves where we're missing GABA? where we're missing certain proteins. Why don't we do downstream therapeutics, OK? So that's a little less specific in that we're, we're not able to target the gene itself, but we may be able to treat a lot of the symptoms because the symptoms are based on this loss of tonic inhibition. So that's where we would do GABA replacement therapy. That's what you're going to be hearing a lot about through Ovid Therapeutics, through OV101. Anti-epileptic drugs, so Valium, that's what it does. Things like Onfi, things like Kepra, anti-epileptic drugs, they're doing exactly that. Or even things like sleep aids, gabapentin, you know, where it's going to help your child sleep, melatonin. Those are downstream therapeutics that are not specific to Angelman, but may be very beneficial in the lives of our children. Okay, And that would be acting right here. So we have one, two, and three. So we talk about that. I want you to think about those areas. OK, so let's talk about number one, gene therapy. We're going to replace the missing gene or protein into the brain. So is that science fiction? Where are we? So what we know is that clinical trials are underway in humans for other neurogenetic disorders. We're not going to be the first, but we are certainly not going to be the last. So we have, in May of 2016, adenovirus was used for a disease called Batten disease, where that gene was replaced in the brain in two little girls. And now that is having, that's under their, uh, clinical trials in phase one. Sanfilippo syndrome, May 2016, gene replacement for another neurogenetic disorder. These are degenerative disorders, which is why it was really easy for the FDA to say, go, 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 because these little kids were dying. So they have a, a genetic disorder that is degenerating their brain, which we are so lucky that this is not the case for our children. In um, 2011, gene therapy was used in Asia, in Korea, for something called AADC. Um, and this has been going on now for over four or five years, I think even almost six years. So we know that many people have led the way for us. So we know that these options are very, very safe, um, which is really wonderful. And we are so grateful for these children for being models for our children, because safety is already being shown through all of these other diseases that come before us. NLD is something that you may have all um, saw the uh, CBS Sunday Morning um, segment that was on gene therapy that was being done um, in Boston and in Europe. Um, the, the, primary, the investigator is in now in Boston, but it was being done in Europe. And um, three of these children were reported in published to be followed for 24 months, and they were cured of this condition through gene therapy and through virus vector gene therapy. So we know that it's possible. And we know that it can be done in Angelman syndrome. And how do we know that? Well, we know that, um, and this is one where I just want to mention, is um, inherited blindness. So this is not so neurogenetic, but inherited blindness has actually been cured uh, as, a, as a genetic disorder in humans in the United States in clinical trials. And this is probably going to be the first marketed gene therapy in the United States very shortly. And it has been able to give people back their vision that were, in, that were genetically blind from this inherited blindness. And this is all through virus vector gene therapy. So I think we have every reason to believe this is not science fiction. This is real. And where are we for Angelman syndrome? So I'm sure most of you know um, that our very own Dr. Ed Weber and Kevin Nash and uh, Jen Daly, who's the first author of this paper, who's also in the audience. Thank you, Jen. Um, they, they already did this. They're miles ahead of where the pharmaceutical companies are. This was published in 2011. And what Dr. Weber and Dr. Nash's group showed was that you actually can do this in an Angelman mouse, and you can rescue their symptoms of Angelman syndrome. So we can cure the symptoms of Angelman syndrome in adult mice with Angelman syndrome using gene therapy. So where are we? Why are we not doing this in, in humans? And, and don't worry, because we, we're getting there, and we are. We'll do it. 
So right now, we're actively working on the ideal candidate of the gene, the ideal way to deliver that gene, the ideal virus vector we're going to use for that gene in order to get it throughout the entire brain. And that is what our scientists are working on every single day in order to get this into our kids. Is it going to have to be through the spinal fluid? Are we going to have to do a small needle in their brain in order to inject the gene? That sounds scary, but it's not really that big of a deal. It may be something we need to think about and talk about and really talk about as a community. Can you give it IV just in their, in their vein and it actually goes into their brain? That's a possibility. Can we put it in their bone marrow? Can we actually do like a bone marrow transplant where we put the gene in their bone marrow and then the bone marrow has cells that can go into the brain? That is absolutely a possibility and it's on the table. So that's exactly what we're working on every single day. Okay, let's talk about number two, activating the paternal allele. Okay, this has been successfully done using those ASOs, those antisense oligonucleotides, and Dr. Art Baudet published this in 2015 in Nature. Success has been reported clinically in humans for spinal muscular atrophy in 2016, and they're moving forward from phase two to phase three clinical trials because it is successful. So this is real, and this is something that is happening in humans that will happen in our kids as well. What about using the zinc fingers, those are ATFs or those artificial transcription factors? This is what Dr. Dave Siegel's group has been working on and published last year. And um, Dr. Barb Bayless, who's in the audience as well, this was her, her paper that she wrote with Dr. Siegel's group. And ultimately, this showed that you can get global brain expression of the gene by using something like a zinc finger to turn on the paternal copy. So this is absolutely real. It is happening in our kids. It will happen in our kids because it's happening in the mice. And that's our goal is to see if this is a viable option for our children. And then finally, the downstream therapeutics, gaboxidol. What is gaboxidol? Well, that is Ovid's, um, Ovid's drug OB101. Um, and that's going to increase GABA at that junction, like I told you. And it's going to improve, hopefully, motor function, sleep, learning, and memory. At least that's what it showed in a model of Angelman syndrome mice. Adult mice, they gave this drug to them, and they found improvements in their symptoms. So this is something that we're going to be starting clinical trials on. Ovid's starting um, in, hopefully, the, the um, 2017. They'll talk more about that. But this is real. This is happening. This is going to be um, the next clinical trial for our children. Ketone esters. This is really interesting. Last year, um, Disruptive Nutrition talked about increasing ketones in the brain, which can improve function in our kids and improve their learning, improve their memory, potentially decrease their seizures. So what, when is this going to happen? Is this happening in, in humans anytime soon? Well, a paper just got published in 2016 showing that in the mouse model, this was highly effective. And this is something we're looking at for 2017 as well. So we are there, we're at the cusp of this, and this is all about to happen. So you need to really understand what we're talking about when these trials come up. And then of course, other compounds are being screened and evaluated daily in order to still come up with other novel alternatives because we're not gonna stop at one option. We wanna get the whole, the whole list of, of options because some things might be better for one child than another. And we're not gonna just throw all of our eggs in one basket. So really briefly, I just wanna talk about how we bring therapeutics to humans. And this is going to be really brief, but everyone wants to know what is taking so long. Why haven't we started these clinical trials? And even though it, so much of the work has been done, the hardest part has been done, the little part that's left is still very, very significant. And what that is, is basically when we think about bringing something to clinical trial, you have a huge number of options of potential medications or drugs that are being discovered. And that funnel effect of thousands and millions of options all come down to one approved medication. And that happens over the course of a period of time through various different basic research approaches. Then we move to drug discovery approaches. Then we move to preclinical approaches. So we have a proof of concept. And then we have to take that proof of concept and say, does that work in an animal model of Angelman syndrome? We're there. We've shown it does work in animal models of Angelman syndrome. And then once we show that, we bring it to the FDA. We say, can we start clinical trials in humans? And then we have to look at phase one, which is safety. Is this safe for kids? So it's going to be a very small number of children and adults. Then we move to phase two, early efficacy. So you know, a larger number. We're not only looking at safety, but now we're going to look at efficacy. Is this effective? Is this working? Well, how do we know if it's going to work? 
And then we move to phase three, which is larger numbers of individuals. So is it working? And if it's working, does it work repetitively over a large number of people? Now remember, this is a rare disease. So with rare diseases, we're very lucky that the FDA doesn't require as many numbers as if you're dealing with a drug for high blood pressure or poor sleep. Because we don't have a, a, the hugest community, it's a rare disease. And we need to make sure that we don't waste too much time if we're seeing benefit that every child will get access to this therapeutic, not just the ones in the clinical trials. So this has to be expedited for rare diseases, which it typically is. So typically, this time period can take three to six years. This time period can take two to seven years. But again, with rare diseases, that's going to be significantly expedited, hopefully. And then the final approval so that it's available as a marketed drug is going to take another period of time, maybe as quick as a half a year, maybe as long as a couple more years. So this is where we're working very, very aggressively to speed this timeline along. So where are we with the AAV gene therapy? We're really close. All of this work has already been done. We are knocking on the door of the FDA. OK? ASOs, those small molecules, just a step behind, getting close. The ATFs or the, the, the zinc fingers, a little behind that, but still, we've done a lot of work here. Gaboxidol and ketone esters, we've already approached the FDA. When I say we, I mean the, the community, not myself. Um, but that, the FDA has been approached. And we're continuing to look at all other novel options. So we're still back here with a lot of the options because we're not going to stop until that cure is there. So we're going to keep working in parallel with all of these options until we find the right cure for our, ch for our individual children. So what does this mean here is that the FDA needs to know that we see improvements. Because if we don't have an improvement in our children, it doesn't matter how wonderful and how brilliant and how graceful this science is. If it doesn't translate to meaningful improvements in our children's life, there's no use in doing any of this. Well, how do we prove our child has a meaningful, improved life? We have to have a baseline measure that is not questionable, that is objective and show that that measure has improved and improved their quality of life. And that's where we have this consortium of the Angelman syndrome biomarker and outcome measure. So we've started a group um, of all of the key opinion leaders in Angelman syndrome, parent organizations, FAST, the ASF, parents, everybody in, the in a group, about 50 people, that all talk about how we can actually bring meaningful impact to the lives of our children and how we can do that in a very clear way that the FDA can say we have proven that this is efficacious for our kids. And Terry Jo Bichelle is leading this initiative. So we're very grateful to her for that. So this is where, where we still have a little bit of work to do. A lot has been done, but a little is left. And unfortunately, even though it's a little bit, that part still takes time and money. OK? So in order to bring them to trial, gene therapy, we're looking at safety. We're looking at models. We're looking to control, the, how can we control the concentration of the gene in the brain? Do we need more? Can we pipe it up? Do we need less? Can we control it and push it down? New vectors to get better distribution to the brain so we don't need repeat injections. Best delivery options, best delivery systems. Which virus? Do we need a virus? Do we use the bone marrow? So these are all the things we're actively working on. Turning on the paternal, OK, we can turn it on in a mouse. But a mouse is not a small person. And the sequence in a human is different than the sequence in a mouse. So we have to find that sequence in the human and make sure we have the right compound for the human. So looking at other animal models, and we'll be talking a lot about this this afternoon. We need to target this in these larger models to show safety, to show efficacy before we put it in humans, and find that candidate that's going to be the best for our kids. And then finally, the downstream targets, we really have to focus on these outcome measures in order to show that we improve the lives of our children in a very, very meaningful way. And then, like I said, we're going to continue in drug discovery. So basically, outcome measures are very important, like I said, in order to prove we have an efficacious result. And we do that in a stepwise manner that we're working very hard at. We need to have fluids. If we're turning on UBE3A, how can we prove we turned it on? How can we measure that in our children? We can't take a piece of their brain, stain it, and say, here's UBE3A. So we have to show that we can turn this on and that our gene therapy or our um, paternal therapy or small molecule therapy is effective. 
okay? And that's where we're gonna need things like blood, urine, saliva, uh, spinal fluid, things like that, okay? So in summary, therapeutics are surrounding our community. I want you to just take this to heart and remember that knowledge is power. And I can't explain to you enough, the only thing that got me through this diagnosis is understanding it. And if you understand it, you will be the best advocate for your child. So continue to understand it, read about it, ask questions, don't be shy. Bang us on Facebook, ask us questions. We will answer them for you, but your knowledge is your power. Ask them. Timing is critical for us to reach the finish line, and we are so close. So uh, I want to thank, on behalf of FAST, all of the families and friends who support Angelman Syndrome, the FAST Fire team, who are amazing individuals. Besides being genius scientists, they're actually amazing individuals, and they believe and love our children. So just if you see them, hug them, kiss them, tell them how grateful you are, because they really do this every single day. They actually lose sleep over our children. Um, all the pharma and biotech um, that have jumped into Angelman syndrome full force, Agilis, Disruptive Nutrition, this is in alphabetical order, so don't, uh, don't hate me for this, Ovid, Roche, Ionis, they're in this. They're in it to win it. They want to do it, um, and they're, they're ready. They believe in Angelman syndrome, so be grateful to them for bringing us to the forefront. And then finally, the Orphan Disease Center at the University of Pennsylvania, who also believes in Angelman syndrome and wants to see a difference in the lives of our kids. Thank you.